Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me to this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Then the king rose, and the governor and Bernice, and who were with, sitting with them, and when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Thank you, Kenan. Well, it's uh, Chuck Norris's birthday. He's uh, 73 today. Yeah, 73. And I wanted to learn some things about Chuck. So I got in line and uh, under chucknorrisfacts.com, I got to teach you some stuff. So that's why you come here. Chuck Norris could teach penguins to fly if he wanted to. Fear of spiders is arachnophobia. Fear of tight spaces is claustrophobia. Fear of Chuck Norris is called logic. <laughs> Chuck Norris doesn't call the wrong number. You answer the wrong phone. <laughs> Chuck Norris has a grizzly bear carpet in his room. The bear isn't dead. It's just afraid to move. <laughs> Chuck Norris died 20 years ago. Death just hasn't built up the courage to tell him yet. <laughs> Chuck, Norris <laughs> Chuck Norris has already been to Mars. That's why there are no signs of life. <laughs> Some magicians can walk on water. Chuck Norris can swim through land. <laughs> Chuck Norris and Superman once fought each other on a bet. The loser had to start wearing his underwear on the outside of his pants. <laughs> Did you know that Chuck Norris could cut through a hot knife with butter? <laughs> Once the cop pulled over Chuck Norris, the cop was lucky to leave with a warning. <laughs> oh, that's good stuff. All right, there's 50 of them, and I know some of you are like, no, no, keep going. Okay. Um, but you could look that up on your own. I think sometimes we look at people that are heroes from the Bible in that way. We, we put them in a place that is just not real. It's just not, it's not even fair to them uh, to do that. We just, and, and maybe there's a part of it, if we do that, then if I keep living the way I'm living, whether it be in disobedience or kind of the mediocre Christian walk, then I can always say, oh, the reason that they're like that is because they're just so holy. I mean, there's statue of them, statues of them in some churches, and there's, there's, they're, they're just not real people. When they'd walk around, they'd almost glow, you know. No. In fact, when I read my Bible, the people I read about, they're really, like, messed up. Like, we're starting, we'll be starting uh, on Genesis after we're done with Acts in about a month or two. And Genesis is like really dysfunctional people. And it's God's way of sh sharing with you and me, 
this is what I work with. And it's all good. It's fine. It's fine. Because then Jesus gets the glory. And that when anybody sees the puzzle of my life coming together, it doesn't make sense. And it's not supposed to. It's that crazy love that Chan, Francis Chan talks about. That, why would you love me? I, I just don't get it. But he chooses to love. And then he chooses to, to work. He's invested in you and me. So let's pray. And then let's look at this. Let's keep going on with this uh, study here as we work through Acts. Another trial. Uh, this trial is continuing. And just ask the Lord to use this to... Um, to, to sharpen our focus and to give us this kind of heart. Let's pray. Father, it's your word. You, you told us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so we're going to be listening to this today. We're going to be looking at it. And so I, we'd ask that you'd build our faith, that, we, that from faith experience to faith experience we would grow, that we'd become people that trust you, that we actually believe you, that when you say things... We really believe it. And that changes our life. That changes how we treat our spouse, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, um, children, parents, uh, teachers, boss, uh, what, what, our, what we look like in the neighborhood, um, what we look like with one another in, in this church family. Thank you for not expecting um, Chuck Norris's real people that you're working on, that you're still putting those pieces together. Thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you want to take notes, there's a section in your bulletin. You can pull that out and fill in some blanks and write some stuff down. And um, First point, number one. First point number one today. Um, we must be faithful. We must be faithful. Look at verse 19 again. So he's continuing on. He says, therefore, and therefore is, all, is a connecting word, and it connects us to the fact that he was starting out his test uh, last week. He, as Tori shared his testimony, and then we moved into the time in the word, uh, Paul started his testimony. He, he didn't, remember, he didn't have to get, go in front of these, these, this group. It was Festus, and it was Agrippa and Bernice. And so Festus is the governor who has, has been, Rome has been appealed to by this prisoner named Paul. And so Festus is kind of frustrated because he's still trying to figure Paul out. And so he goes, maybe if I get an Agrippa, this, this king uh, in the Judea area there, maybe he understands Jewish things. Maybe he understands a little bit about this, what they would consider a sect of Judaism called Christianity. I'll get him to hear him, and then he'll give me some advice, because when I present him to Nero, I want to have something on the paper that makes sense, because Rome doesn't want to be bothered with stuff. They just don't like that. And so he wants something to write on that paper to send with him. And so he bring, he calls him, and remember, he doesn't have to meet with him, but Paul is constantly, instead of looking at these kind of things as um, detours on what he should be doing, he looks at it, it's all of his life as ministry. All of it. If, if um, something happens, he didn't look at it like if, if he was driving a car today, and the, the tire exploded or, you know, there was a puncture or whatever, and he was stuck, and now he has to go and get it worked on or, or something happens or somebody pulls over. He's constantly thinking kingdom. He's constantly thinking this didn't happen by accident because God's in charge. He knows what's going on. And so it's not a detour instead of going, oh, I've got to do ministry. I can't believe this is happening to me. It's actually, the, yeah, you will do ministry. Maybe you'll meet a mechanic. Maybe you'll meet somebody on the side of the road. Maybe you'll meet somebody at a restaurant. Maybe you'll meet somebody in this situation. No detours. None. God's not stupid. He's in control. And so he's going, well, i got another opportunity to talk about you. And so... Here's, here we go, verse 19. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. This call to ministry, like the call to salvation, it's a sovereign act of God that demands and incorporates a human response. It's that puzzle piece where he goes, 
I'm doing this in your life, and it's not a rejection of it, it's a, recept a receptivity of it. See, Paul was obedient to that call. And by the way, obedience is huge. Sometimes I think it's sidestepped today. Um, you'll hear some of um, the old songs we'll sing about it. I hear it in many of the choruses, but sometimes maybe we're not listening for it. God calls us to obedience at times. Obedience is a part of true salvation. If, if I have truly received Christ, I, I begin to love certain things. That's why when David, who actually lived a grace-filled life pre-grace or pre-church uh, age, I don't want to say pre-grace, it's always been about grace, and so David would say things like, he'd, he'd write songs and he goes, how I love your law. Now you think about that, how I love your law. That's like when you drive down the street and you actually are so happy to see police that are there. And it's because I'm obeying the law, I'm, I'm doing it. Why, why wouldn't I like them? Well, maybe I'm speeding at that moment. Maybe I'm like, you know, I'd like to go faster. I don't like the law, okay? But if I'm being obedient, I, don't, I love it. I'm so happy that they're there. David sings, I love your law. Look at this. Obedience being a true part of salvation. Romans 6, 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? 1 Peter 1, 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. So obedience is a part of true salvation. It also acknowledges God's authority, Acts 5, 29. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men, or even the fear of man. Sometimes the fear of man is something that motivates us. Always looking over our shoulder, wanting to please men instead of God. Uh, or it's an expression of trust in God, Hebrews 11, 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. To just step out. I don't get it. I mean, to, uh, Kurt Young last week when we were talking, he was talking about deaf ministry, and God just put this on him. And he's like, I don't even know sign language. I, what are you doing, God? And God, just one step at a time. One step at a time. It gives us just, I, that word is a lamp unto my feet and light to a path. It, the, the picture there is that lantern, just enough light to take the next step. Don't feel this need, I got to know everything. You don't have to know everything. You, by the way, you'll never know everything. Trust. And it's a proof that believers have a love for him. John 14, 15, and verse 21. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest, manifest myself to him. And so obedience is huge to God. It's, a, it's, a, it's just, it says something concerning me. Verse 20, back to Acts 26, verse 20. But declared first to those in Damascus then in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and also to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. This verse summarizes Paul's ministry. He gets saved, he, he is justified, and God starts doing a work. And what does he do? Right where he's at. He begins in Damascus. That's where he was heading to, to persecute Jews. Where does he start his ministry? In Damascus. It spreads to Jerusalem. And then uh, he influences Judea, and then to the Gentiles. And then he, and he preached the same message. Repentance, metanoia is the Greek. It means a change of mind that results in a change of action. Turn, epistrepho, it describes sinners turning to God. True repentance does this. It changes lives. Verse 21. For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. So he's doing good things. 
And then what happens? It's because of preaching that the Jews did this. So first of all, we must be faithful. Secondly, point number two, we must be fundamental. We must be fundamental. Look at verse 22. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. He had been um, delivered twice from two plots against his life. And he put the message of the gospel with the same authority as that that had been given by the patriarchs. And so he, he's just preaching Old Testament to them. He's just telling them, and yet he has this group of people that would say there's, there's validity or there's authority in the Old Testament. They are people that are, that are speaking out against him. And so he keeps going back to the prophets. He keeps going back to the Old Testament. And that's all I did. And, and this is what's happening. Point number three, we must be factual. We must be factual. Look at verse 23 that the Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Messiah must suffer then rise. This uh, first, by the way, first to rise here, it's a, it's a first of preeminence. and It's not a first chronologically because we know that Lazarus rose from the dead before Jesus did. It's it's the ultimate resurrection, and because he rose from the dead, that's what Easter is all about. Um, we have power. We have it all. And uh, I don't know if you remember a little while back, there was a, uh, a thing that happened. The Southern Baptists actually did this thing, and this is all they said. They wanted to start praying for the Jewish people that they would recognize Jesus as their Messiah and turn to him for their salvation. That's what the, and they put that out there. They said, we're going to start praying for that. And the uproar that happened. That was in the late 90s that that happened. This huge uproar that happened. There, were, there was editorials and papers. There was letters to the editor. There was frustration uh, back and forth concerning this issue. And um, there's, by the way, Jesus, I, I've said this before, but I want to say it again. Jesus is his name. Christ is his title. Okay? It's not his last name. Okay? And what it means is it's Greek for Messiah, the christened one. Okay? So it's Jesus the Messiah, if you could translate that every time like that. If you don't have to, but I'm just saying that it makes it easier because I think sometimes we go first name, last name. That's just what we do as Americans. And as a result of that, that, that would frustrate somebody that would not want to acknowledge that he is Messiah. See, the Jews believed that a Messiah would come and because it was promised that he would come. And that he would deliver them. And they wanted, they wanted Chuck Norris. They did. They wanted somebody that would come and just clean house and take care of the Romans and stuff. Because why? They had guys like David in the past that did it. They had guys in the past that, that would, um, the judges that would take care of it. And so they're thinking, okay, we got it. Now it's not the Philistines now, it's the Romans. And then this person comes along and he's not that. He'll conquer but it's a spiritual battle that's going on. And so this happened, and the, 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 this happened in the late 90s, and there's so much frustration because the Jews today, many of them, don't look at the Messiah as a person anymore. What it is, it's the nation of Israel. Like when Isaiah 53 is talked about, it says he was bruised, and they metaphorically make it that the Jewish nation is the thing that suffered. The problem with that is, um, how can something suffer for itself? Okay, because the salvation has to come based on what that Messiah did. How do they get saved if it's them that's saving them? And so Paul is hammering 
he, about the prophets. He probably brought up Isaiah. He probably brought up, because Isaiah 53, in case you wonder, you know, is that talking, this Messiah, he's, this Messiah was going to suffer and die and then rise from the dead. The Psalms said that, that the chosen one would not see corruption. And so that's all that Paul is preaching. And so this is nothing new. It's in the 90s. Guess what? It's going to come up again. It's going to come up again. The Bible is relevant. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Jesus Christ is the one who saves. Jesus Christ came to the Jews, and he's still saving Jews and Gentiles for his glory. And so this is why, this is why they're frustrated, because they don't want that. They want their salvation based on their goodness. And God won't have it. So we have to be factual. Point number four. We must be frank. We must be frank. Look at verse 24. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice. So if you could imagine, they're sitting there. We've got Festus and Agrippa and Bernice sitting there. And they're hearing it. And he's reached a certain point where he is either frustrated or whatever, but he says with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. That's such a great verse for college students, probably. <laughs> They're probably going, that is so true. Okay, my great learning is right. That's why I'm such a frustrated person around the house, mom and dad. It's biblical. Okay. <laughs> Festus had listened to this whole time, and then he responds. Any intelligent Roman knew, knew that dead men do not come back to life and talk to people. Therefore, he's not dealing with the reality. This is the craziness of this thing called the Christian life. But guess what? Jesus had also been accused of being insane. Did you know that? Jesus was accused of being insane while he was on, by his own family. His own family. Mark 3, verse 21. Mark 3. And when his family heard it, they're talking about him and what he's teaching and talking about. They went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. They thought he was nuts. Um, John 8, verse 48. John 8, verse, the Jews answered him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Verse 52. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. And then John 10, verse 20. Many of them said, He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? This is what they said about Jesus. So there's going to be times that you and I take a stand for Jesus Christ and are saying actually the right thing, and it will not make sense to people. By the way, don't do that just on a whim, on your own, and then you are a nut with what you're saying. And then say, well, Jesus, you know. It's got to be biblical, all right? Verse 25, verse 25. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. He spoke from a sound mind. Total control of his senses. Verse 26. For the king knows, I love this, he, Festus says what he says, and then he says, I'm not out of my mind, Festus. I'm in my, a sound mind. I'm speaking rationally on these things. And then he points at Agrippa. And the king knows, for the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly, for I'm persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. Don't you love that? He speaks to him almost in third person. Festus, I know you're saying this stuff, but I want you to know the king knows what I'm talking about. He knows the history of the Jews. He knows uh, the prophets. He understands these things. And there's got to be a part in him that knows, man, this Jesus Christ, he did fulfill the Micah 5 too, Where Jesus was talked about hundreds of years before he was born, the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem. Hundreds of years, it was said, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. That the, that the Messiah would do great miracles of healing. Jesus healed people. And that this same, this same Messiah would suffer, Isaiah 53, and die. And even um, just being a curse for you and me. Because cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. 
Because how would they? How would he know to put in the, to to put that in the Bible? Curses he who hangs on a tree. And the the Jewish way of killing people was stoning. And hundreds of years go by. Rome takes charge, and the way they like to kill people is crucifixion, and it's called put on a tree. Metaphorically speaking. And Jesus used, God uses that picture because it's like, I knew that this would happen. I knew this would happen to my son. And so he, Paul's preaching this stuff, and he's preaching, and, he, and he, it's almost like he's saying, Festus, I hear you, most excellent Festus. He's being gracious to him, but he says, the king knows what I'm talking about. Last point, point number five. We must be forthright. We must be forthright. Verse 27. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I love this. I know that you believe. Don't you love the confidence that he has? I know that you believe. By admitting you believe the prophets, then you have to believe in Jesus as Messiah, since he fulfilled all the prophecies about Messiah. Verse 28. And Agrippa said to Paul, I love this. It's, he's going to shift it. In a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? Literally translated, do you think you can persuade me to become a Christian in such a short time? You ever talk to somebody about the things of the Lord? You want to reach them, and your heart is, yes, I do. I want to reach my entire family for Jesus Christ. That should be our goal. And it's biblical. Verse 29, and Paul said, I love this. He didn't go, no, no, I'm just, a, you can like Jesus, you don't have to, it's okay. It's like, no, he says, Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am. I love that. I remember Don Schneider shared his testimony before. And uh, if I get it wrong, Don, correct me later. Like you always do. No, I'm kidding. Um, and, but he talked about the fact that there was, I think it was at a restaurant or somewhere, somebody was sharing the gospel with somebody else, and you're on, just on the outside listening to this. And you're like, I believe that. And you receive Christ. You were wholly eavesdropping. Okay? I love it. I love it. And, 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 uh, it, it, it's, it's powerful because that's the Spirit of God. And so I feel like he's talking to Agrippa and he's talking to Bernice and he's talking to Festus and he's sharing his heart. And there are some people around. Remember it was talked about that there was great fantasia, great pomp, the word is when they came in. So they got people with the fans and grapes and all that stuff going on. And, and there's all these people around and just praying. I'm not just talking to you, Agrippa. I'm not just trying to leave you alone. Joe over there. What, me? Yeah, I want to reach Joe, too. Everybody, whether short or long, that's my heart. We're called to this, friends. It's not, uh, it's good for some people. It's good for it all, for everybody, because it's the truth. We need Christ. No matter how long it takes, it was Paul's desire that people would know Christ. Verse 30. And oh, by the way, look at the end of it. He says, I would to God, verse 29, that not only you, but also all who are hear me this day might become such as I. And look at this, except for these chains. He, didn't he wasn't like going, yeah, I'd like you to become like me, but of course I'm stuck in these chains and you should be in these chains, not me. It was gracious. It was like, I would love for you to have the freedom that I have in Jesus Christ. I wouldn't want you to be shackled like this. I wouldn't want you to have to be a prisoner. I want the best for you. Even though you've, I've been put in this situation, I want the best for you. No bitterness. Verse 30. Then the king rose, and the governor, and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. Once again, the entourage moves together. Verse 31. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, don't you love this, the, the, the talk that goes on behind the scenes when you and I think, oh boy, I dropped the ball. I don't know if Paul ever felt that way. I feel that way sometimes when I'm sharing. Just, oh, I stumbled all over my sentences, my tongue got in the way, I don't know how, you know. But God, it's God's work. 
It's not my work to save people. It's God's work. My work is to, to just be obedient to him. And whatever the, whatever the view of his sanity, they all agreed he wasn't what he had been charged with. They, they saw something different. And I love also that he didn't back down when he saw them responding a certain way. He didn't go, no, no, just, okay, maybe you didn't get it because I, I don't want any rejection. Jesus is like really cool and he loves you just the way they are. You can keep living the way you are. It's okay. He didn't change his, his message. He told the truth. And how they respond to it, that's up to God. Verse 32 Oh, verse 31 ends. This man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. Verse 32. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. He had to go to Caesar because the appeal had been made. Chuck Norris. Read one more here. When Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone... He had three missed calls from Chuck Norris. <laughs> another thing happened, 1876. Another thing happened today, 1876. Alexander Graham Bell made that talk, and this is what he said. He said this, his first telephone call. He said this, he cried out, Mr. Watson, you listening, Tom? All right. <laughs> Mr. Watson, come here. I want to see you. It's the first thing that was said. That's the title of today's message. Come here. I want to see you. I believe God's calling us. He's calling you and I today. And he starts off every one of his letters, Paul's, starts off and he talks about what God has done because some of you may hear this puzzle piece stuff today you might be hearing all this stuff and you're like I have tried I am so tired just let me do church I don't want to go any deeper in this thing but I want you to understand if you ever take from me condemnation that's not what I want to give you from the Lord I want to do ministry like Paul did ministry and what he would do is he'd write his letters and if you look at this every letter that Paul wrote Every letter that Paul wrote, the first half of the letter starts out this way. And you can check this. First half of the letter starts out this way every time. This is what God has done for you. Every time. You can check it later if you want to check it and go, I don't know. But at a certain point, he's looking for a response. That's why Romans 12, 1 and 2, I heard so many youth retreat, youth rally talks, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so they would say that to me. And it's truth. And I would walk away from that. Oh, I want to walk with God. I want to walk with God. And they didn't have time to do this. They didn't have time at those youth rallies to go through from Romans 1 through 11, which was a bunch of stuff that God did for me. Then I got 12, 13, 14, 15, and then 16 is just him saying goodbye to the people in Rome. So he's got those four chapters just for the, the end of the book that he's telling, here's what I want you to do with Jesus. Because some of you are sitting here and you're trying to do Romans 12 through 15 in your own strength, not realizing he flat out loves you. And if you're like, I don't know how much he loves me, the cross. You ever start losing sight of that? He loves you. Oh, I don't know. I'm just Quit it. He loves you. More than your parents. It's hard to believe. More than the person that you think loves you the most. He loves you. And he's for you. He is our righteousness. It's him. So 
So I want to encourage you today, between you and the Lord, you say, Father, I want to take a step of obedience. You're, you're taking the puzzle piece. It may mean I need to start spending time with somebody that's going to pour into my life. God, I ask you, and I don't think he's going to fight this prayer. God, bring a mentor into my life. Or, Father, maybe I should be mentoring somebody. Or maybe I need to step out and do this. I don't know. And the beauty of it is I don't know, but God knows, and probably you know. Let's make that our prayer. Because we could start up some programs, you know, oh, we ought to evangelize more. Oh, evangelism, I believe in evangelism. You know what? I really believe if you get fall in love with Jesus Christ and, and you're so into him and you're walking with him, you can't help but evangelize. He'll just come up because you're into it. I don't have to convince you, love your grandkids. You know, you ought to love your grandkids more. If I have to do that talk, boy, you're weird, all right? <laughs> but you're evangelistic about your grandkids. All the paper and all these pictures. Whoa, I get it. You love them, all right? I picked that sports. I can talk about that all day, but it doesn't mean anything without Christ. And I could start listing a bunch of things. Whatever your thing is, put it in that blank. Christ, give me a love for you. So this isn't, I don't have to try. Let's make that our prayer. So that when we're called before the Agrippas and the Festuses and, the, and Bernice, all right, that it would just happen.